Okay, Andy, you're now live. Thanks, Julie. Colleagues, welcome back. Uh, this is um, the uh, restart of the Great Manager Combined Authority Meeting that we had to pause due to technical glitches. My apologies uh, for all of those, but we were on item five, uh, the financial implications of COVID-19 uh, across Greater Manchester. And we will just briefly uh, recap uh, what has been said so far. We have a very uh, comprehensive paper before us, so thank you to David Molyneux, Steve Wilson and everyone in the districts who's been involved in preparing this. It is an in uh, an evidence based factual um, analysis of the, the financial position and I, I should stress not the worst case scenario. This is the most likely scenario if all things uh, stay at the same. So, you know, Greater Manchester here is, is, is putting forward the facts and uh, I hope, hope people will accept that there's no uh, attempt to sort of paint the most pes pessimistic picture. This is just a, an honest assessment of where of where we are. And obviously, as we go forward from here, councils will uh, be increasingly um, taking responsibility to manage the, the crisis as we go forward from, from here. The package of announcements from the Prime Minister yesterday will uh, place more pressure on local authorities with regard to, to managing things, uh, as well, of course, changes to the shielding policy that will come in August. So councils will have a big job to, to manage the crisis and live with COVID for the next uh, year, at the same time as, as laying the foundations for financial recovery. And, and that's really at the heart of this meeting today. Councils won't be able to fulfil that role if uh, this um, shortfall uh, is um, not uh, covered in their, in their budgets. And if, if we're honest, as we look at, at the picture, as we end the first quarter of this financial year, it's a, a fairly eye-watering um, scenario uh, given the scale of the the damage to to local authority uh, finances caused by the um, caused by the crisis so we were we were hearing from leaders um, about what it means uh, in their uh, in their localities and um, I will uh, ask uh, councillor Brenda Warrington to, uh, to 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 recap briefly followed by uh, mayor Dennett before I invite Sean fielding to pick up uh, as well where he was so uh, Brenda, if I could in, invite you um, first to um, uh, uh, to say uh, a few words and recap some of what you said earlier. OK, Brenda. thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, first of all, can I share your thanks um, for all the work that's been done by uh, CA staff and of course um, people back in the districts for the work to compile this position for us. Clearly, we're, we're all facing unprecedented pressures. And it's clear also that government funding uh, is completely insufficient to cover the additional costs and income shortfalls that are being borne by all of us in GM. Uh, it looks like central government funding and support amounts to less than 40% uh, of the gap that's been created by the crisis. Now, in, in the report, um, it is clear that districts have all stated uh, that they'll be making a contribution from um, their own reserves to actually help uh, to solve this problem during the financial year. Uh, it still isn't enough, we know that. Um, but uh, what I've noticed, and I'd ask for um, some clarification on this, please, is that there doesn't seem to be any reference um, for uh, the combined authority or the Transport for Greater Manchester to utilise any of their reserves to mitigate the problem. So I, I wonder if I could have um, uh, some clarity on that, please. So in, in Tameside and probably most others, we are looking at around 20% of a budget pressure in the next financial year if we don't receive any further funding from government. And I'm sure we'll all be scrutinising our budgets for savings, cuts and efficiencies to avoid uh, that dreaded potential Section 114 notice. So we will be instigating on a daily basis, uh, line by line budget reviews, and we'll be squeezing everything possible. Uh, now, also, it, the report doesn't also uh, appear to deal with the uh, proposals about what the GMC action might be uh, to take care of balancing budgets. Uh, and just as an example, 
Uh, the levies actually make up 15% of Thameside's net budget and, and it would be um, useful for me to know what options and actions the combined authority is looking uh, to contribute to reducing those budgets. Uh, that would assist, uh, assist districts uh, to meet the very challenging financial position. Uh, we can't expect uh, for us to make cuts to our services without the CA also uh, acting similarly. And we know that we're seeking to continue to protect uh, our most vulnerable people across all of the communities uh, in, in Greater Manchester. And we, we do need uh, for the CA to, to review the reserves and resources with a view to supporting these uh, challenges. Uh, and there are many of them. And of course, we, we do need refunds uh, to districts wherever possible. So if I can ask what, what extent is the combined authority considering in terms of reviewing its reserves, its capital programme and general budget to uh, assist uh, the districts. And we know that local government is best placed to support the population to ensure a continuation of vital services and support and protection of our most vulnerable people during any emergency situation, quite frankly. We have the essential local knowledge to address each and every circumstance that may possibly arise. It can't be controlled by central government. Uh, it cannot be handled by Westminster. But having said that, what is required from central government is that local government is afforded the necessary and vital additional resources to allow us to provide those essential services needed. What we don't need are promises to reimburse us for additional costs and then for government to renege on those promises and therefore plunge us into potential situations of possible bankruptcy. Uh, we can still hear the Chancellor now, I'm sure, at the beginning uh, of, of the um, press conferences in March that they would um, spend whatever you need, we will, we will reimburse whatever it takes or words to that effect. Um, just as a point, for, for Tameside alone, we estimate the potential excess costs to us uh, down, down to COVID are going to be in excess of £42 million. And that, of course, as we've said, is, is something that could increase. So far, we've received just £13.9 million to assist from government, and that isn't even a third of what we do need. Uh, my, my, my view is that the handling of the pandemic by government has quite honestly been shambolic. Uh, people have lost trust uh, due to the ongoing confusing and often conflicting messages that have been coming to us from government ministers and their advisers. And we need to work very hard jointly, central government and local government, to regain that public trust. And that, of course, needs to begin by local government being treated fairly in all areas of the country uh, by appropriate and necessary resources being reimbursed to us to truly cover the costs incurred uh, by the COVID pandemic. We, we really want to rebuild our services and we really need to continue uh, the delivery of our ambitions that we had prior to the pandemic. Uh, the elephant in the room, of course, uh, is the, the fact that we may actually have a second wave hit us. And if I know that the current uh, report doesn't take account of a potential second wave and I do fear that that if if that is the case then we are really in deep trouble so that is something that I do think we have to keep very much in mind uh, we have to plan for that uh, hoping it doesn't happen so I, I will end there Andy uh, but just to say I do support the recommendation that uh, I believe you're going to be moving thank you Thanks very much uh, indeed, Brenda. Um, and that point you make about the need to reset the relationship between national and local governments, I think is a point uh, very powerfully uh, made uh, and will be necessary to rebuild a sense of national unity as we enter this next phase in tackling the, uh, the COVID uh, crisis. You raise questions, uh, Brenda, about um, uh, combined authority uh, reserves uh, and uh, levies um, that, uh, that, are, that are applied to districts. So I will ask 
uh, Steve Wilson and uh, David Molyneux to pick those up at the end, but, uh, but, but thank you for your contribution. I'll come now to um, City Mayor of Salford, Paul Dennett, then, uh, then to Councillor Fielding. Thank you very much, um, Mayor Burnham. Um, first of all, can I just place on record my thanks to obviously colleagues at the Combined Authority and also the treasurers across the 10 local authorities for pulling together what is a really robust and comprehensive piece of work. And obviously this comes at a time when government are going to be announcing a fiscal event next month. And, you know, there's a fair funding review looming for local government, a comprehensive spending review. And we're still waiting for that green paper on how we finance the future of, of social care. Um, one of the things I wanted to draw attention to really was the context within which this report sits, because I don't know if colleagues are aware, but IPPR North have published this month a report into the, the last years of um, the last 10 years, actually, of, of austerity. Um, and, and there's some really interesting findings in that work, because for me, this isn't just about numbers. It's not just about budgets. This is about the importance of local government as an institution. And importantly, it's about people and it's about services and it's about protecting us as we've already heard from Councillor Warrington, the most vulnerable within within our communities and, and, and our local authorities. But interestingly, um, IPPR North highlight that the department, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, have seen an 86% cut in departmental expenditure um, since 2009-10 up until 2018-19. And obviously what we've seen in local government is the furthering of what I would refer to as the engagement with regressive forms of taxation. So council tax increases and precept increases. But what's also important in, in their research, in my opinion, is what's been happening in terms of local government employment in contrast to central government employment. Local government employment has actually dropped from 2.9 million people to 2 million people, whereas central government employment has increased from 2.8 million to 3.3 million people, which raises some really interesting questions, I think, about the government's commitment to devolution and the Northern powerhouse leveling up, rebalancing the economy. You know, the language changes over time. And it certainly indicates to me from a resource and expenditure point of view, what we're seeing here is further centralization of, of, of power and decision making and resource allocation. Um, inevitably, though, 10 years of austerity um, does have an impact on our financial resilience as local authorities, and it also has an impact on our preparedness in terms of dealing with a global pandemic that certainly I've never seen the sort of in, in my lifetime. Um, interestingly, the report also makes reference to the work of Sir Michael Marmot back in 2010. And obviously, you know, 10 years on, we know that austerity has increased um, the wider determinants of health and well-being within our communities um, and not in a positive way. Um, health inequalities are widening and life expectancy, as we know, is stalling. Um, and we know more recently from the work of Public Health England that there's huge challenges around dealing and tackling the structural inequalities that we've been facing for many, many years. Importantly, though, this, this is all about people and IPPR North talk, touch on the importance of children and life chances for children. Looked after children have risen by 39% in the North. Um, nationally, we've seen an increase of 28% since 2009-10. And obviously, we all know of the national crisis in, in children's care, and our budgets speak to that, really. They're routinely overspending. Also, the National Audit Office in 2019 makes reference to the work of Ofsted, highlighting that 58% of local authority provision of children's social care is deemed inadequate or requires improvement. I draw attention to these, these um, evidence bases, if you like, because I think it starts to illustrate the, the task ahead of us and the real challenges we're gonna actually face in local government moving forward. Also pupils per teacher, they've actually increased from 21 to 27. So now our, our teachers are actually having to spend more time with more pupils and obviously spreading themselves thinly in terms of the time they can allocate to um, our children's education. And between 2009-10 and 2018-19, we saw 400,000 more children in relative poverty across England, a 12.5% 
increase. 50% of that, so 200,000 children, are actually domiciled in the north. So we've actually seen a 22% increase. Again, illustrating challenges before us all. Special educational needs as well, IPPR North make reference to. The North has seen per pupil figure for high needs in 2019-20, 33% lower than it was in 2013. Importantly for me as well, in terms of my brief within the CA, temporary accommodation. The Northwest has seen the highest increase in temporary accommodation. Back in 2010, it was 2,000 households. That's now risen to 3,875 in 2019 and over 5,000 in the North. But importantly there, when we're talking about temporary accommodation, 50% um, of those households include children. So again, in terms of life chances for children being moved around accommodation, not being able to settle in communities and, and obviously commit to that, that environment, that community, build social relationships. There's a whole host of challenges that arises out of that. And then when we look at the labour market, median weekly pay in the North has grown by you know, less than 2% since 2009. We are facing a job quality crisis, in my opinion. Stagnant real wage growth and in-work poverty, zero-hour contracts, low pay, part-time employment, all demonstrative of what we're talking about there in terms of in-work poverty. Work was obviously once seen as a route out of poverty, but I think that is really being challenged at the moment. And the reason why that's important as well is because it's a useful proxy to illustrate how even people in work are struggling to make ends meet. And if we're engaging in you know, regressive forms of taxation, council tax increases, precept increases, you quickly realise that that will have a disproportionate impact on those who are struggling with in work poverty. Um, obviously, we've been clapping our carers and our key workers and our NHS on Thursday. And, you know, I'm acutely aware at the moment in Salford that to bring all of our social care staff up to the, the real living wage in the city would cost my local authority 3.7 million. 3.7 million that we don't currently have. You know, at the moment, we're looking at a £38 million overspend in this financial year alone. And that's after um, the impact of the government COVID emergency funding. So that's the net position for the local authority. Since 2010, we've lost over 2,000 members of staff and demands on local authority services have continued to grow exponentially. But I think for me, what's really important in all of this is that we we thank and pay, pay tribute really to all the amazing work that's been done by staff in local government. You know, our care workers, our waste operatives, school teaching staff, nursery staff, also the voluntary sector who've done a sterling job within the city of Salford, our NHS businesses and importantly the residents of Greater Manchester who I know have been helping us all through this really challenging and, and difficult time. For me though I think this report lays bare um, the real stark challenges ahead of us and it also raises really important questions about the government's commitment to the northern powerhouse levelling up, rebalancing the economy and what devolution is actually going to look like in the future. There's been a lot of rhetoric and I think the numbers speak for themselves, but I think we should see this work in, in, in light of that broader challenge of actually transforming the North. And, you know, we have serious challenges ahead of us and I think the evidence speaks for itself. And, you know, I'd like to see us taking an evidence-based approach to further dialogue with government. Obviously, we wait with interest to see what's going to be announced next month, but I think the challenges speak for themselves and obviously to rise some of these challenges requires adequate resourcing of local government. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Paul. Um, I've now got uh, Councillor uh, Sean Fielding, uh, Eamon O'Brien, David Greenhouse, Councillor Elise Wilson. Colleagues, I do need to finish this meeting by, by one o'clock. So if I could ask everyone to just have an eye on the clock. Um, over to you, uh, uh, Councillor Fielding. 
Thanks, Andy, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to speak on this today and for the officers to pull in pull, for pulling together this report. Um, I think the, the thanks from all of us goes without saying. It's obviously taken an awful lot of effort to pull together what is the financial impact of us all on COVID. Uh, of COVID. Um, I do just want to make a, a quick observation on uh, Mayor Dennett's comments about the reduction in employment uh, in local government and the increase in the employment in central government. I think that's just symptomatic of a, of a government that that says one thing and does the other. It, it talks warmly of localism and it talks about devolution and empowering communities. But in reality, what we see is further centralisation uh, and we've seen it over the past 10 years. Taking the example of schools, uh, academies have been taken out of the control of local authorities and handed to the Department for Education uh, and even on local government funding, rather than giving us the money to get on with what we need to do and trusting us to cater for our communities. What has happened is that the government has created discrete pots that are quite narrow about what they can be spent on, that we then have to spend a load of resources on uh, putting bids into as local authorities. Uh, and so that's all effectively a, a diktat from the centrally in Whitehall about what we can and can't spend our money on uh, locally. Um, so I think I do need to thank the efforts of volunteers in Oldham. Um, the, uh, the efforts at the Central Food Hub are absolutely incredible and the system that they've got underway there uh, with an army of people driving, picking uh, food, uh, collecting things from, from donations from local businesses has become so efficient that um, it is catering for uh, an increase of around 147% in terms of the number of people accessing that food bank, but doing it really easily, really efficiently because of the, the goodwill of volunteers that have come forward. But a byproduct of that efficient system and of COVID-19 is that that has flushed out huge numbers of people that prior to the crisis were simply coping and getting by and weren't necessarily known to local authorities, but probably should have been. So whilst we had huge levels of demand on local authority budgets and, and service preventative services in Oldham, as I'm sure is the case for all of the other councils in Greater Manchester, that is likely to be even greater after this because we have found lots of people that will need our support and arguably should have been receiving it prior to us going into lockdown and to them flagging up uh, by ringing up for a food parcel. And this is all set against the backdrop of a cut of in excess of £200 million to the revenue budget in Oldham. And I know that uh, leaders on this call will have their own figures. That represents almost half of our revenue budget since 2010. Uh, and over the next year, well, in this year, we have an in-year pressure of £21 million, So that's £21 million worth of cuts to find. And in 21-22, we've got a further pressure of £45 to £50 million. Now, it's quite, uh, you, you can feel quite removed from it sometimes when it comes to council meetings in the budget book and it's listed in a spreadsheet um, and you talk through it at meetings on a PowerPoint, but actually this is people's lives. The mayor of Salford is absolutely right. This means jobs. It's not something like, you know, the library that somebody might say, oh, well, I rarely used it anyway, so it doesn't matter if the hours are reduced or the community centre that's closed that somebody might say, oh, well, I never went in anyway, so it's not a big deal. Or the Meals on Wheels service, which has been cut, but people might say, oh, well, my grandparents never accessed it anyway. The thing that's really important in this is that it is people's jobs and livelihoods, hundreds of jobs in Oldham alone and totaling thousands probably across Greater Manchester have been taken out of the system. That is less money going into the local economy. That is less money that people have to spend in local businesses. And it's also fewer opportunities for our people. In Oldham, we have dozens of people that have started at the bottom and worked their way up and done really well uh, through committing their lives to public service. They might have started as a council gardener and now they're a director. They might have started on the bins and now they're assistant director or, or whatever it might be. They started, might have started as a social worker and worked the way up. And those kinds of opportunities for our young people are really being reduced if we have to make even further cuts to fund the COVID-19 response that we were told we were going to get all the money for anyway. And I think that what has been shown over the last few months is that people do care about these jobs. The, the Thursday night ritual that Paul referred to, and which we all probably took part in, 
and the rainbows that people have been putting in their windows show that people do value public servants. They weren't just clapping for NHS workers, they were clapping for home carers that work for low wages and often unsociable hours. They were clapping for the street sweepers that kept the streets clean and cleaned up after the rave that we had in Daisy Nook last Saturday. They were clapping for the refuse collectors. And I think apart from uh, a few grumbles from the kind of people that wait outside the pub for happy hour to end in Oldham, people have been, our refuse collectors have won plaudits in Oldham because they have kept that service running through really difficult times with higher levels of staff absence and really took the rubbish away so that people didn't have to store it on their properties. And now, this isn't about calling on the government just to give us the money so we can relax and give us back all the money that we had back in 2010, as nice as that would be. This is about empowering us to deliver for our communities in the future, because that is going to be more necessary than ever. And we've got a track record in Greater Manchester of doing that. In Greater Manchester, as a result of work by this combined authority and local authorities in directing money to where it is needed, homes have been built that otherwise would not have been. Businesses have been supported and jobs retained that again otherwise would not have been had it not been for the work of local authorities and the combined authority. People have been trained with new skills and helped to transition into other areas of the economy when they've lost the jobs that otherwise would not have been had it not been for the intervention of local authorities and the combined authority. And not to mention the way that we did not have a PPE shortage in Greater Manchester throughout this crisis in the way that other parts of the country did. That was because of the expertise of people here locally responding to local demand and knowing what they need to do. So the, the, the request of government in this, and I do support the amendment that you detailed at the beginning of this, is that the government needs to give us the money to deliver, but it needs to trust us, fund us properly, and give us the flexibility and the freedom that we need because we know what's best for our communities and if we are if we are prevented from doing so through having our funding reduced even further it will be catastrophic for people right across greater manchester thanks thanks very much uh, sean some very powerful uh, points there uh, particularly the one about um, people clapping all uh, public servants and particularly council staff and that's so uh, so true and obviously if things stay as they are jobs would be at risk uh, as a result of the, uh, the huge gap in council finances uh, and as we've all said these are essential workers supporting our community so thank you uh, Sean and apologies to interrupt you uh, earlier. Uh, now bring in councillor Eamon O'Brien. Thanks Andy for that. Um, I won't repeat the points but I do support what's been said so far and happy to support the amendment you've, you've proposed as well to the report. I think what's becoming really clear to everybody in local government, well it's already clear to us, uh, uh, you know across all political parties, across all types of councils, that the government is going to have to put money into the local government system and I think at this stage, the government knows and the Prime Minister knows the scale of the challenge. And so I think it's important that we keep up the pressure because it's not good enough for the government simply to point out the, the support they've already given, because we all know that's not enough. And in fact, I would, go, I would go as far to say that to just fall back on the money they've already given and still potentially lead to bankruptcies of councils up and down this country would not just be a terrible thing for local government, but would be actually a waste of the money that they're already, you know, trying to take credit for. So we need to be saying that's a good start, but they have to pay up the rest. Otherwise, what was the point? And we just, I think, have to be quite blunt. And I think that this uh, factual account of exactly where we're at uh, does that in a way uh, that isn't saying, well, we just need more money to avoid difficult decisions. You know, this is about saying you said you would pay. This is what we need and this is what is necessary. So I think uh, it's absolutely right. We keep up the pressure, even though it's clearly obvious to everybody involved that the government needs to give some more money. And I just wanted to give us a, a sort of a little um, comment from my perspective as a new leader, um, because one of the things, you know, I've been doing this past month is talking with all of our partners around the councils outside of what we've been talking about really so far, which is our amazing council staff, 
uh, in whichever role that they perform and the lengths that they've gone to throughout this crisis to keep things moving. But of course, it's that it's that ability to draw together the entire borough, which local government uh, can do. Uh, and that's our, our range of businesses and our business leaders. That's our housing providers, our health colleagues, especially those in the CCGs. It's our community and faith groups. It's our volunteers. It's our care homes more, more, more than ever. And my worry about the government not giving us what they promised is that we risk losing what has been a, a key part in the in the response to COVID, uh, which has been drawing together the best of everybody, focusing on uh, a massive challenge. And what we shouldn't be losing out of the emergency response phase is that ability to come together and tackle common challenges. And I suppose that's the opportunity we could lose by turning inwards and looking at our finances um, it's not just meetings like this, you know, think about all of the hours that our officers have spent. Think about all of the time we've had to spend looking at this situation, worrying, the uncertainty around it, the, the inability to plan properly, uh, the, the doubts, the delays. All of that is time wasted away from actually dealing with the challenges we face in whichever uh, borough or city we come from. You know, we've got we've got to get businesses back. We've got to stop people falling into the, the poverty trap and not being able not being able to get out. We've got to deal with issues like the climate crisis and loneliness and and mental health. And we will be less able to do that if for the next year or two we have to scrabble around looking for more savings and cuts that will not only damage people, but will take that time away from doing the really positive things that we've seen we can do by coming together in local government and our partners. And so I think that should that, you know, I think it's important that, you know, we make the case for local government, but I also think it's important we say that local government has that special role that's been cemented throughout COVID and the response that we are the leaders in our areas. You know, maybe not we don't have as much money as we used to, but we still have that influence. We still have that reach. And importantly, I think our partners see that as well. And it would be a terrible thing to do to retreat from that leadership role and have to turn inwards on ourselves to then come back with devastating cuts that hurt people's livelihoods and jobs, which others have quite rightly highlighted will happen. So I think that has to be as much our response to government as well, that to secure the recovery, not just in the immediate sense, but in the long term, we've got to have local government f financed properly so that we can utilize the best of our partners as well uh, and so i just wanted to add that that particular point because that's been my overwhelming experience from the last month seeing the benefit of partnership working and the potential we have to do even more if we're funded right thanks andy Thank, thanks very much indeed uh, Eamon. a very important point about the voluntary community and social enterprise sector which i'll come back to in summing up so from Berry to Bolton, Councillor David Greenhouse. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I'm going to start where we obviously have a great deal of, of, of common ground. And uh, I want to start, first of all, thanking the huge amount of work that's gone in uh, to what is an incredibly important paper. So thanks to Steve Wilson, to um, my fellow leader in, in Wigan, David Molyneux, uh, and the team, and the whole team of treasurers that, that have brought this uh, very important piece of work together, which, which outlines in black and white just what, what our challenges are. Um, I think it would be very remiss of me not to give a heads up for me personally for Team Bolton and for the incredible uh, amount of work uh, that has gone on, not just in the uh, humanitarian response which has just been simply phenomenal and I colleagues I'm not going to repeat what colleagues have said about you know how humbling it has been to see people you know volunteer during lockdown uh, and deliver you know literally um, thousands of people within their communities delivering uh, to the most vulnerable uh, and that humanitarian response but also I have to say to the key essential workers as well a huge thank you we'll be indebted to them uh, uh, forevermore really uh, not just those working on the front line of the of the NHS and social care and home care, 
but but also you know i think it's been alluded to our, our key services within our councils you know who've kept those services up and running despite staff shortages which have been understandable because of uh, shielding uh, and loved ones shielding and and those that have been within the vulnerable set so a massive massive thank you to those and ending as well as we said within the humanitarian the scores of volunteers that have come forward it, it has been Phenomenal. I know we're not unique in Bolton. It's been across the whole um, conurbation, but but that has to take uh, some precedence. Um, I also want to uh, the common ground is that I completely agree that um, local government will be inevitably and has to be inevitably at the forefront of recovery. We're best placed to deliver on it with the local knowledge, and uh, I, I think it would be absolutely. Uh, uh, remiss and misguided of anyone to think that that would not be uh, the case. Um, I also want to say that uh, regarding the paper, uh, we have the current situation, but of course we have situations moving forward and within departments that where we know there will be extra challenges moving forward that we, we can't predict um, uh, at the moment just how serious they will be, particularly around um, the adults and children's portfolios, but we know that they will will come under. Uh, we, we can only estimate at the moment what those uh, challenges and extra pressures will be. Um, but um, I, I think, you know, in, in the next few months and even over the next uh, going into the next years and year after, uh, we're, we're in for some significant challenges uh, in those areas. So I, I want to acknowledge all that. Um, what, what I am, I suppose, uh, in a slightly different page uh, as the only single conservative uh, on this uh, uh, in this group today um, is I, I actually believe that government um, has already presented a pretty much unprecedented package. Uh, I think they'll continue to do that. I know we are involved in what is political theatre here today. Uh, I know there are conversations going on, as I know many of you do, that uh, conversations are ongoing cross party with the local government association, lobbying for those extra tranches of money. Uh, I know many of us will have been involved in feedback. We're all being continually asked by uh, government to produce audits, regular audits, uh, obviously taking up time and resource, but, but those audits are for a reason. They're for to know where we are as a council, exactly where we are. This paper expertly presents where we are, but it's but it's right those are going on. And and I speak as someone who is lobbying for it, but I would be incredibly surprised that if there is not another tranche uh, of money coming to us with a lot of targeted uh, interventions, uh, specifically around the areas that many of you have been going uh, on, on about today. And of course, I welcome that and I'll be shouting from the rooftops if that does not happen. But I think we have to acknowledge that there are a lot of conversations going on with government. We're presenting very much an image of a government that is not listening today. And I think the government is listening. You may disagree with me. You may disagree with me how hard they're listening, but they are listening and we shall see what happens when we get the fiscal response. Uh, in in uh, which coming up in, in a few weeks time. Um, I want to actually I got before I started and I, um, I, I want to agree uh, with the leader of Thameside uh, in terms of the uh, the use of reserves in a GMCA. It's very much we are going back to government and we're going uh, hands out and I, I appreciate that's where the bulk of it's got to come from uh, the vast majority. But it is absolutely right that we should be leading from the front at GMCA and we should be looking at where we can help our own authorities and where we might have reserves. And, you know, why haven't we done that already? And I think, you know, we're having a discussion today about, um, uh, you know, the finances. Um, I think, and I've said this, as you all know, in previous meetings, um, I think we need to be looking wider at our own set of priorities post COVID. Are we really committed to some of the uh, measures and some of the initiatives that we had prior to COVID? Do we see that is recovery? Does recovery out prioritise uh, those some of those initiatives at the moment? This is not to say we won't go ahead at some time, but, you know, should we be really looking hard at ourselves on how we ourselves are spending our money in GMCA? So I think that is another thing that, that, that I would raise. Um, I, I do think, as I said before, government has responded. It is important to note that, you know, overall, although not directly all coming to uh, uh, um, 
our individual authorities. There has been a package from government coming into this conurbation. If you include the business rates and the rates relief that have come on, the council tax relief, business grants, when you include care home fund, the money we've had for the Metrolink and all the money that we've had for our authorities, even though, and I completely acknowledge we need more, that has come to a package of nearly 1.5 billion for this conurbation. Uh, and I think we that should be something that is uh, applauded. We need more. I'm not going to say we don't. But, you know, this is an unprecedented package. And when we talk about government money, it's not and I'm not going to I'm terming a phrase that became quite popular a few elections ago. It isn't a magic money tree that government are just printing money off and send it up to us. And thanks very much. And we'll use it. It's our money, our residents. It's our residents. It's government money. Our residents have to pay for that. It's, it's not some magic box that we open up that government has that they just are able to send us. It's our residents that will have to pay for this money and pay for it in the future. And of course, it's been well recorded. You know, it's been, there's been unprecedented debt built up as a result of this crisis. And of course, we argue and we continue to argue these are unprecedented times and it is needed. But it's, it's worth pointing out. It is the teachers, it is the nurses, it is it is your bin men, it's all those people in their taxes that will have to pay for the government money that we're asking them to send back up to us. So that I believe needs pointing out as well. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit because of course it has become uh, quite political of course, it has been mentioned about political conflict and the government's reacted badly and they're useless and such like, you know. I think this has been unprecedented. Yeah, there have been U-turns, but we've lived in unprecedented times. We've had to be reactive rather than proactive a great deal. And, you know, yesterday we're talking about a second wave. I've heard it raised. Is it the right time? You know, the Labour leader himself yesterday broadly welcomed, I'm quoting, broadly welcomed the proposals that came out yesterday. So not everybody from every party is going to agree with everything that their own parties are doing at the moment. But hindsight is a wonderful thing. And all I would say, it's great nationally to be in opposition at the moment because you can't please everyone. So I'll finish by simply saying that um, I do genuinely uh, I will support the amendment. Uh, I, I am a little bit disappointed how it's all been dealt with, if I'm being honest, and this this last minute change. But, you know, I, I who wouldn't as a, as a council leader at the moment with all the challenges and pressures, who wouldn't support uh, an amendment that's asking for um, uh, anybody to 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 make that to make that amount up? So so I will support it. Uh, I think we have more common ground than we don't. Uh, and I think uh, I, if there was just a little bit more of acceptance, similar to the letter that went off from Councillor Wilson and the mayor this week to the prime minister, which was a lot more pragmatic and a lot more sharing and a lot more acknowledging of, of, of the position we were in and the uh, then 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 I think that would be a lot more helpful. I think this is a partnership. We have to work together with government. We're not against government. This is about us working together and regarding the devolution about giving more power. Can I just remind us all we wouldn't even be sat here with the mayor if it wasn't for a conservative government. So so let me just remind you that that was the commitment to devolution. Lots more work still to be done on that. But let's be realistic about it. It's a conservative government that has delivered on why we're sat here today. So I am happy to work with you all. Um, I'm sorry it's become over political. Uh, I regret that because we're all in the same uh, boat here. We all want our councils to be able to deliver on those services. Nobody goes into politics to make cuts and, and, uh, and deliver savings. We all want to deliver positive outcomes for our residents and that's what we're all involved in. So I hope uh, we can all work together moving forward and uh, I, I will support the amendment. Thank you. Th thank you, David. Uh, and uh, just to stress, you know, I very much uh, want to re-emphasise the, the points I've made about this being a partnership between national and local governments. If local government's been asked to do more, then it is about that, that partnership. And we welcome the funding that's been allocated today on, on homelessness, uh, for instance, which very much answers a call that we've we've made. So thanks, David, for your contribution. I've got Elise and Andrew Weston, but colleagues, if I could ask you to limit yourselves to a couple of minutes each, because I do need to finish the meeting at one o'clock. Uh, Elise. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am going to do my very best now to be um, very, very brief. Um, I will say I agree with uh, the report is a very detailed evidence based report. I agree with the recommendations in the report and the amendment that you've proposed. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the thanks. Th my thanks. I add mine to everybody else's as well as uh, in line with everybody else has said. And I um, support the comments that have been made uh, generally. However, um, I had planned on talking much like everybody else about the impact on Stockport uh, financially and the impact on 
the combined authority and um and I prepared something good to say and then um I had a conversation with a resident and um and I was getting animated and excited and telling them about this meeting that we're having today um and talking about what we can try and do to make it and do you know what she says she says Elise stop stop because you've lost me I don't know and do you know I like I don't really know what the council does so she says uh, you know I'm I'm uh, but I take your word for it so I said oh um right well let me put it this way and I think what's important and that's why I think it's important to share it with you today um is for me if you think about Greater Manchester City Region as a family and like our families, we've got grandparents and parents and kids and siblings and aunties and uncles and, and the aunties and uncles we call auntie and uncle that are not really our auntie and uncle. And the friends that we uh, have, you know, got relationships with that have either become family to us or joined our family with us. And you think of all that and you think of all the characters in the family. Uh, you then think, well, where does local government fit into the family that is the Greater Manchester City region? And I'd say local government is the bit in a family that goes around being unnoticed, right? It's the picking up after everybody when they've come home after you've just cleaned the house and they've just got in and dumped all their stuff. It's it's the agonising conversations about which is the best school or should we move house or how are we going to pay the bills? It's 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 the bit that says, OK, um, how are we going to kind of mediate this difficulty or disagreement and, and, and navigate in all of those hardships and challenges that families face? It's scribbling in a way uh, to make sure that everybody has the best that they can to succeed at school or at work and, and be healthy and happy. It's, it's making sure that the kids have the right school uniform for day one at school. It's, it's organising the events and the celebrations that brings families together and sharing the good times and supporting each other through those really tough times. It's the listening and caring um, to the stories and the problems and the difficulties that other members of the family are facing. And it's the youthful enthusiasm that pushes the boundaries, that pushes against the rules and says, well, why? And because isn't there isn't good enough an answer. And, and that is the bit that local government sits in, in that greater Manchester family. That's the difference that local government can make. And that's the space that I feel that local government fills in our greater Manchester family. And, and if I was in a room now with with uh, Boris and, and, and Rishi, I'd be saying, do you know what? It's been it's been so hard. I mean, what a crisis, what a difficulty that we have all had to face um, and we are still facing today. That it is still there. This virus is still there. And what a terrible thing. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people nationally have died. We're mourning hundreds of people in Greater Manchester, hundreds of people in Stockport. We, we know we're worrying about people who are poorly now. We are uh, worrying about what the future is going to look like. And that has been incredibly difficult. But I would say, and my ask, and there it is, is that learn from lessons, be agile, be innovative, you know, keep going. We had a response. There was things in that response that was good. There was things that could be better. Let's look at what those better is so that we can apply that to recovery. And one of the things that's better in the response in recovery could be to deliver on that levelling up. That could be part of the lesson is where the local bit, where we can make a difference. Um, and I want the government to succeed at this. I know it's probably not a popular thing to say because I can't bear it. I, I watch the news and I see people uh, poorly, dying, sick, worried and I want us with it you know I want us to get through this I want our country to get through this and I want this corner that is Greater Manchester of this country to get through this um but we need to do that together we need to deliver that local government can deliver that we can do that by working together but we need that immediate injection of funding and for that resident I said to her what we need is a bit of cash now we need a bit of a cash now to see us through like everybody else in this country has had to see a look use they needed a bit of cash right now to get through the tough times we need a bit of cash right now to get through but we also need a long-term conversation with a real commitment to making a sustainable way forward for everybody and I get that 
and, and we need that commitment. So I'd say, I am absolutely there. I am with you. I'll have the conversation. I'll come and see you or you can come and see me. Let's have that conversation and let's do that and find a sustainable way forward. Um, and, you know, because at the end of the day, like every family, this great Manchester City region, it needs local government. It needs that glue that picks up and sticks us all together and sees us all through. Sorry, maybe I went on a bit long, but thank you, uh, Mr Mayor, for the time. No worries, thank, thank you, Elise. Uh, Andrew, I will have you to ask you to be brief, Andrew. I apologise for that. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I wasn't planning to come in, but I did just want to respond to some of what David Greenheld had to say, because I think part of the difficulty with the narrative that's been put forward there is that we're going with our hands out, that this is political theatre when actually there are conversations ongoing. And actually, if we were not concerned, if we had confidence that this money would be forthcoming, if the government hadn't said repeatedly that there was no more money, had they not rejected the fact that income is a vital part of how we survive as local authorities, then we wouldn't be having this meeting today. And that is the nature of the problem that we're facing that we get what it takes. And that we can offer. We are talking about our ability to function as councils, to deliver statutory services. In Trafford, if we have to make the cuts that the government's posturing on this and pontificating on this suggests we will to avoid a section 114 notice in the form of an emergency budget, we will need to take out after reserves 25 million pounds. And that is not one of the largest numbers in the conurbation, but it is a terrifying number for us and it will leave us facing potentially the inability to deliver even our statutory services. So we need to take this extremely seriously. I'm not here as an act of political theatre today. I'm here because I have no idea how my council is going to deliver for its residents moving forward, even at that most basic level our statutory services and the services that our residents get to us day in day out is that serious and it's all very well saying we think the government is starting to listen they need to act and they need to act now we shouldn't be here today we should have this money in the past some time ago as we were promised and we should all be in dreadful emergency budgets to try and have bankruptcy notices the fact that we're all in the same boat says it all and the fact that conservative councils up and down the country are saying that too is indicative this is desperate and this needs action now so on that basis i'm very welcome to the amendment i'm happy to support it thanks Thank you very much uh, indeed, Andrew, and thank you, colleagues, for your, um, for your for your contributions. Everyone's made a powerful contribution today, and obviously there are strong feelings, but these are big issues for Greater Manchester as we now face up to the challenge that lies ahead uh, with uh, COVID-19. Uh, I did um, propose an amendment to the um, recommendations at the start. Let me briefly recap to you all that amendment. Uh, and it says, the combined authority notes the Prime Minister's announcement yesterday and the previously announced changes to the shielding policy due to start at the beginning of August believes that these changes will increase the funding pressure on local councils and that it is essential that they are properly resourced to manage them and therefore calls on the government urgently to commit to cover in full the shortfall in this year's budgets. Although people have come from different perspectives I've not heard any dissent so colleague can I ask you that that amendment be approved? Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you uh, very much, and, and that is obviously a clear a clear call. That is uh, a united call coming out of this uh, this meeting today. 
it obviously is dealing principally with uh, council funding, but I think it's important for me to say we recognise the pressure too on our partners in the voluntary uh, community and social enterprise sectors. Uh, and of course, if the government wants to help councils, that indirectly will help our partners in those in those other sectors as well as we all try and rise to this challenge together. It is about national unity. It is about building a sense of of common cause. So we hope the government will take what we're saying today in that in that spirit. Uh, and uh, with that, colleagues, I, I thank you all for your uh, attendance today, for the work that David Molyneux and Steve Wilson put into this with the district treasurers. Uh, and I think we've got a clear resolution coming out of today. Uh, and I will, of course, now ensure uh, that that is taken uh, taken to government. So colleagues, apologies for the um, uh, technical challenges we've had today. Uh, thank you all for your powerful contributions and uh, I will see you at the next Combined Authority meeting on Friday. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Everyone.